Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tracy Skatestra and this is Body Talk. Every week, Embodied Learnings brings you Body Talk because we're committed to bringing the body into the school curriculum as well as into the classroom. We do this because we think it is so important for student engagement, student learning, mental health and wellness, and for thriving classrooms and school communities. Now today I have a very special guest. This is somebody that I think is one of the most wonderful educators. I have worked for the past nine years with Nancy Steele, and she is here today because we're gonna be talking about exploring Indigenous perspectives through dance and drama. Hi, Nancy. I'm so, Hi, Tracy. I'm Lovely. so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I always love a chance to talk about, uh, about this subject because it is so fascinating and, and wonderful uh, as a way of approaching learning. I know that um, most of the things that I have I've learned in my life with any intensity have come when I have experienced them in the body myself. So congratulations on having this particular uh, forum for us to discuss how best to increase that kind of learning because the learnings are deep. Um, let me tell you a bit about myself first. I'm a settler on this land. I, um, I have um, been involved in learning about the history of the indigenous people here. I come originally from the United States where I learned very little about indigenous people there, education, but um, I have uh, spent quite a bit of time now uh, talking to indigenous people, uh, doing research, and hope that some of the things that I've learned uh, from working um, intensely in this area will be of help to some of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank some of the people who have helped me and tell you a bit about why I feel it's important that, that you hear about them. The first person um, is Justice Mary Sinclair, whom you may know was the head of the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission from 2009 to 2015, I believe. And um, at one point, he came to where Tracy and I met, which was the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where I was teaching uh, at that time, and spoke to uh, a group of uh, people who were teaching there and, and people who were studying there. And part of his speech was about why it was important that we do this work. And he said, you know, I have... I, I'm no longer talking to lawyers about what needs to be done. Now I believe the work needs to be done by teachers. And um, given the, uh, the number of settler teachers that we have in Canada, uh, that work belongs to us. So <clears throat> Justice Murray Sinclair, who is a, a lovely man, and I encourage you to find out what you can about him, uh, has given us permission to do this work. And this is something that settler teachers often worry about. Maybe the people, indigenous people, do not want us doing this uh, work, talking about their histories. They should be doing it themselves. There are many more of us than there are of them. Uh, I think indigenous people are only about 3% of the population of Canada. And there are, um, oh, about a million uh, a million and a half indigenous people, 37 million of us. So uh, we want to uh, work on as our work as well, because of course we benefit from uh, what our ancestors on this land have done uh, in huge ways. And we need to acknowledge that and recognize that we still benefit um, unfairly from what was taken from indigenous peoples. In any case, there are other people I'd like to thank. I have um, many indigenous friends who have taught me so much. Um, first, Dr. Jean-Paul Restoul, who was uh, one of the founders of the Deepening Knowledge Project at OIZ, uh, and who had in his last meeting before he moved to BC to take over indigenous education there um, in the university there, uh, said what he really felt was important about the Deepening Knowledge Project was the fact that settler teachers and Indigenous people were working together on this, um, creating um, this uh, website and the, doing the work of teaching, and that this was the important way forward. Um, 
I also want to thank um, John Doran, Dr. John Doran, who's Mi'kmaq from Shubenacadie, part of the 60s scoop, who has told me about his experience being taken from his uh, Mi'kmaq family in uh, Nova Scotia and brought to Boston, where he was adopted by an Amish family. Um, he has since um, learned a tremendous amount about his uh, people and his language and uh, has taught me much. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Alicia Arndt. We're going to talk, I believe, Tracy will talk a little bit about the Build a Community um, drama that we've done at with teacher candidates uh, that is embodied learning. Uh, and uh, Alicia wrote the script for that. She's Mohawk and uh, writes about her particular nation and her community and their past. Um, I would like to thank Ryan Neepin. He's Cree. He is also, I've worked with Ryan uh, over the last three or four years, he's taught me a tremendous amount about what he's learned, finding out about his indigenous uh, relatives. So there are other uh, heroes of mine in indigenous arts, uh, Alanisa Bomsawin, who's a filmmaker with the National Film Board and is in her 80s now and is still making films, um, a marvelous documentary filmmaker, Thomas King, uh, also an indigenous writer, if you uh, get the chance to uh, read anything by Thomas King or listen to his Massey lectures, I recommend you do that. And um, Richard Wagamies, another person who was uh, taken from his uh, community and made peace with uh, his past. And if uh, I find his work, especially his final book, his meditations, uh, just powerful and and inspirational. So these are the people I'd, I'd like to thank, as well as Angela Nardosi, a mutual friend of ours who worked in the field and has taught me a tremendous amount. She, her doctorate is in Indigenous education. She recognizes her settler past, and um, but has extensive networks through Indigenous communities in Canada. So those are the people I wanted to thank. And, um, and I think, Tracy, maybe you have a way forward now to help uh, lead our discussion today. Yes, and I actually um, also had the pleasure of working with uh, Ryan Meepin and uh, Dr. John Doran, as well as um, Dr. Angela Nardozzi. And I want to thank you because you were one of my first teachers. So all of those people that were teaching you, you were then teaching me when we worked together. You were one of the... Um, you know, you hired me in teacher education at OISE, which is part of the University of Toronto. And that was really where I was able to bring my um, arts background and really see within the cohort, which was Aboriginal education, how I could start to actually do this work with students as well and start to feel more comfortable. So I want to thank you. Well, you're most welcome <laughs> and thank you for doing the work. Yes. Um, and I also really want to just touch upon, um, and you already sort of went through it at the beginning, but I think it's really important that we just kind of be really explicit that one thing that teachers need is to feel confident. They need to know that this work is, um, they are welcome that they are welcome to do this work. So uh, I know that we've talked before about sort of some key things. So again, one, um, allyship is something that you and I have discussed. So if you could just, again, just reiterate uh, why teachers are so critical for doing this work. Well, as, as I was saying, the, we are, um, we are the, mainly the people who are teaching the children of the next generation. And we are, because we uh, outnumber Indigenous people in this country so uh, massively, we need to be the ones who are helping our students learn this history, who are helping them try to make some sort of uh, contribution to fixing what uh, has happened to Indigenous people and the relationship between uh, Indigenous people and settlers uh, in the past. And, um, and I think that, um, that because we know so little and we have been taught so little in the past about this history, it is important for us as adults to find out uh, what the history uh, really is about. And that uh, information is available. Uh, I recommend that you, um, that you do as much as you can 
uh, to find answers to the questions that you have. One of the things that I, I was mentioning uh, before to Tracy was the fact that, um, that students love having problems to solve, having questions to answer, mysteries to solve. Uh, there's a great mystery involved in, uh, in colonization. When uh, indigenous, when the Europeans arrived here 500 years ago, the, um, the population of the Americas uh, was, uh, it, it's probably in over at least 6 million people, could be up to 60 million people on some estimates, but even if it were only 6 million people, hundreds of people who came from Europe in those first years uh, were outweighed by um, these mass numbers. What happened that changed this so dramatically? So that now we have, we are uh, 37 times the population of uh, indigenous people on this land uh, in Canada. So how has this, um, how has this uh, change occurred? What caused it? And there are all sorts of answers to that. If you um, don't know the answer, um, tell your students you don't, and that we're going to try and find this out together. Students love to hear that teachers um, are uh, ignorant about something and want to find out with them uh, what happened in the past. And um, as I also, I believe, have mentioned to Tracy, I, um, I feel it's really important that the children um, learn things through uh, relating them to their own lives and experiencing them themselves. And, um, and I first started doing this with a man who uh, was an anti-racist educator with the Toronto Board of Education named Tim McCaskill. He taught um, uh, anti-racism in high schools and had a camp for students where he did in four hours the history of the world. Wow. And the history of racism, he called it the world history of racism in minutes. And that uh, worm, uh, is now available online if you're interested. When I did that with Tim, uh, was really the first time I ever began to understand how history progressed and what happened. And I began to use that with my students when I taught at alternative schools in um, Toronto. And the students there were, um, were so happy to have had that before they did their world history course and, and uh, said well, they were one of the few people in the class who really understood uh, what was going on in the world historically. So if you don't consider yourself a history buff and you want to really learn about history, take a look at Tim's World History of Racism and uh, it'll help you uh, understand uh, that history, there is no um, cause without an effect. There's no effect like racism without a cause. And that if we understand these things in our bodies and through our bodies, um, to give you a little experience of embodied learning, I did this uh, with Tim and I was in role as an culturalist uh, throughout history. And uh, at the end of the, of the four hours, I said, Tim, I was poverty stricken and starving the whole of my life. And that was, you know, uh, 5,000 years in, in, that we did in this morning. And he said, well, there you go. We're <laughs> farmers today. Anyway. Embodied learning is really quite an experience. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, I guess, today about how we can embody learning uh, about Indigenous people without cultural appropriation and without um, the things that uh, Indigenous people rightly worry should remain theirs to teach and theirs to have as private uh, parts of their culture. This is the way all cultures feel. Certain things should be specific to them. So, um, where should we start? Do you want to look at um, uh, the Build a Community or do you want to look at A Morning on the Lake? What, what Why don't way? we start with, um, we can start with A Morning on the Lake. And what I really love is um, how when you talk about this book, you really talk about how you bring children's own experiences into that of the other, those so that they can really start to understand the other perspective and ways of knowing. So I can start by holding up the book so people can see. And I'll make sure that anything you've mentioned, Nancy, books, or again, you talked about um, uh, you know, just all the things you've mentioned so far as resources. I'll make sure that I actually can provide links for people um, with this video so that they can see those. Lovely. Well, Tracy, if you hold up the book again, yep. what do you do with the, um, with the students, as I say, when do you think uh, this story takes place? 
And because they recognize the canoe, and it doesn't look like a fiberglass canoe, um, they say, they often say, oh, a long time ago, because the, and the, the uh, man at the back has a feather in his hat. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Indians a long time ago. And I say, what's the little boy wearing? And oh, it's a life jacket. Are there Indians now? The children ask. Well, yes, indeed, and they're called First Nations people now, and uh, there certainly are First Nations people now. So what we uh, uh, then do, depending on the age of the group that I'm reading the book with, is we, uh, we can look at what they already know about First Nations people. So um, oftentimes um, the stereotypes come up, uh, and those are... Uh, need to be listed, and as we as we begin this study together of First Nations people, we um, we see which of those stereotypes are um, are incorrect. What pieces of them might be useful for us to understand what happened in the past? All of these things begin begin to come up. We also talk about their own experiences in nature, and uh, for the very little ones. Um, and uh, I would do this with my grade seven and eight students too. I would have them go back and uh, think of a moment that was special to them, either on their own in nature, the way the, uh, the grandfather in the story takes his uh, grandson out in a canoe in a very early morning on a lake, um, or with someone who um, is a, a, a special person to them. And I have them go back into their memory and recreate that memory sensually. So I have them close their eyes and picture the scene, see all the little details that they remember, hear sounds that were in the air, smell the smells that of um, the trees and the flowers or the pine needles or whatever it was that they could, um, they could remember. Mm. And, um, and from there, if the children are old enough to write things down, I stop them and have them write while, um, uh, while they're remembering so that they have uh, information that, that they can use either to write a story or to write a poem. And I've had such beautiful uh, poetry come from this kind of an exercise. I know you, Tracy, would do dance, uh, mm -hmm. movement, uh, creating that scene. Uh, we could do art. There are all sorts of ways in mm -hmm. to think about experiences in nature that were very powerful. But the book goes on to talk about um, other parts of indigenous culture that we want to explore and relate to the lives of the children who we're reading the book to. So the um, little boy goes in the middle of the day with his grandfather and uh, climbs a, a mountain that he notes his ancestors have footprints, have carved away the stone of for thousands of years. And that connection to our ancestors and to the past is another way that we can help our students relate to their own lives. Mm -hmm. Do they have a knowledge of a past of the people, their grandparents, great, great grandparents, uh, going back as far as they can in history? These are things that, um, that are important to us. Uh, and when they get to the top of the mountain, there's an experience there, which I won't, um, I won't reveal now, that's very magical for the uh, boy and his grandfather. And then the grandfather takes them in the night into the woods where they meet some wolves. And uh, the relationship of the grandfather to the wolves is very different from the relationship I would have had probably with my grandfather in the woods, <laughs> had I had one. Uh, the, um, the grandfather treats the wolves as uh, brothers to um, the humans and sees that they have uh, a business to be about in the woods. And uh, teaches his grandson how to behave with the wolves in the night. So um, all of these experiences are things that, that can uh, echo experiences that our students have had, our children have had in their lives and provide rich, um, uh, rich information for stories, for dance, for artistic expression, body learning. Mm, wonderful. And as you were talking, and I was just thinking specifically of, um, sort of movement and, and you first start by just how you bring memories into your body, which I think is so important, you know, and then how we can express that 
through our words, by creating poetry, or again, we can express it by, you know, just bringing it into our bodies. I mean, it can be simply, you know, take that memory and how does it feel? Can you think of an emotion? Now, if you were to show that emotion through your body, what might that emotion what would it look like? How would it move? So it can be as simple as something like that. Or I know things that we've done together um, with another book that we will hopefully talk about, which is She She Etko, is just this idea of what you want to remember. And so in that story, you know, there's a young girl who's with her family before she's got, taken to residential school, wants to remember everything there is, the water and the trees and the berries and um, just, just her whole surroundings. And so I remember we did some wonderful activities with teacher candidates, which is perfect for children, which was having them, you know, explore like what are the leaves on the trees and show the different shapes and are they high and are they low and if they were hanging from a tree, how might they move if the wind picked them up and carried them through the air, how might they move, how might they settle and fall on the ground. Um, I remember we explored the ideas of water and sounds of water, like drop, splash, um, you know, just all those different sounds. And we gave students scarves and asked them to actually move the, 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 the words and the images of water then through their body. So it's amazing how you can take a story and you can, in so many ways, lift it off the page. Um, mm -hmm where you're not appropriating anything, but you're, 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 you're understanding the concept, you're connecting to your own memories as well as the author's story and what they're, they're sharing with you. And we're, we're somehow making it our own in some way. Mm -hmm. We are all raised in our own culture, mm. but underneath we are all human. And that connection is so important because we have, our human experiences that we share with all cultures. Yeah. So um, I think you're absolutely right, Tracy. I think that um, as children especially can relate to the books about children and their fears. Yeah. Uh, I think um, I think there are several books that we're, we're going to talk about. Um, the uh, companion book of the young brother of Shishietko, who is frightened when he's at residential school. Right. And I know that your uh, people who are listening are, are, may know something about residential schooling, but they may not know how difficult it was for children to even talk to their siblings there. So, um, so he had something that was able to comfort him uh, mm -hmm. when he was there. And of course, we all have little things that comfort us when we're feeling very anxious. So uh, all of those are our common humanity mm -hmm. uh, feelings, and, and we, we need to share those um, with others and and we do so um so there I, are I was yeah, sorry, I'm just going to mention one thing that you really um you really helped me in terms of how to understand those feelings because I don't know I'll never know what it feels like to have to leave my family and go to a residential school but I do understand a feeling of loss mm -hmm. and I what you always did so well was what would it, what are all the things that you value the most? Mm -hmm. Our culture, our family, our language, our food, our traditions. Imagine if those things were taken from us, mm -hmm. how would that feel? And so there was always these ways of taking whatever that was in the story mm -hmm. and bringing them back to our mm -hmm. life. And then from there, we could explore them through an artistic way we could be more self-expressive so that was something that I, I i've always gone back to it's like what's in the story that is relatable so where do we where do we find that common ground and then move from there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know the um it hearing things mm -hmm. is very different from seeing things um done yeah and when I'm thinking about what you just said about the things that are so important to us. We also did an embodied uh, experience telling the history of um, Alicia's community, the Mohawk community, uh, uh, their experience of colonization. And she has written the script for that. But what we did 
when we put people in that particular uh, reenactment, uh, we didn't ask them to take on the roles of indigenous people. We just act, act, asked them to sit in a circle. And, um, and we asked them what it was, as you said, that would be very hard to lose if you were told you could never have this again. And invariably, family was one of the things that we would write on a piece of paper, almost everybody. Uh, they could choose one thing, and many, many people chose family. Other people chose places in nature. Other people chose celebrations. All of them put in the center of this circle. And as Alicia's story of colonization um, played out, we took those pieces of paper away until there wasn't anything left in the center of the circle. And that experience of watching your own piece of paper disappear and what the colonizer brings food to the people because their natural sources of food have been taken away. And uh, a child who is being hidden um, in the story, uh, the parents of that child, uh, and not allowed to go to residential school by its parents, the parents of that child are told that if they, um, if they do not send their child to residential school, the, the rations for the whole community will be cut in half. And we had pictures of those rations, the, the salt, the flour, um, the uh, cheese, uh, processed cheese that the community had. And they were, um, those pictures were torn in half and half was left because they refused to let their child go. So they could imagine how it would be to try and live on half of the food. Those particular moments were moments of intense experience for the people who were watching. And I think that is important to add. Mm -hmm. know, uh, when I was doing the world history with my teacher candidates just this past fall, one of the teacher candidates after said, I had a little boat and I was trading along from throughout Europe. I've never had an experience like that before, moving the, the jewels, the, the fake jewels we put on top from one area to another and trading for what was there. I understood it in a way I never understood before. So as many times as you can, add pieces of, um, of experience that aren't just words coming into the person's head. Give them a physical experience with whatever you're doing is what I would recommend. And with Build a Community, what was so interesting is that as the story was being told, you know, our whole class, people were invited to stand in for characters in the story. So we didn't have to act anything out. We just needed to be in place of characters. So we started with, um, I think it started with a small circle of people um, I'm trying to remember and then I knew there were warriors but some of us played children and as the story was told people got sick and died children were taken away again um, we were given food food was rationed so you're listening but you're in it even though you're, you don't have to act out a part and that was I remember for me with the build a community was what was mm -hmm. so powerful is you you saw the building of the people coming together and then the stripping away of everybody as people were taken or died um so it it, it was nothing like sitting in a chair being read to where your mind shuts off because you're mm -hmm. getting tired and you're thinking of the text that's coming through on your phone <laughs> right, right everything is aside right. and you're, you're a part of it. And I think what we're saying is that everything is about how do you be a part of the experience so mm -hmm. that you really have that, um, you know, it's about the emotional experience, um, mm -hmm. very much so. I think that's where the, the, the most learning is, how does it make us feel? It's mm -hmm. hard to have perspective if you cannot somehow connect to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On that emotional level. Absolutely. And some teachers, uh, many teachers, worry about the tragedy of this story, which is so difficult to see and to hear about. And, um, and I'd like to say that you, you do need to take care of your very youngest learners. So you want to, um, to make sure that the, uh, you tell this story at an age-appropriate level and that uh, there are pieces, for instance, in the Build a Community, uh, because we were doing it with adults, and it was originally written for high school, um, it was possible to show 
um, that the children who'd been brought to residential schools when they came back from the residential schools were horrified by the fact that they had to stay in their community, many of them, and, and were not able to become part of the community again in a meaningful way. They'd experienced abuse. They had been told that the, their parents' religion was a demonic and that, um, and in many cases, they can't, couldn't eat the food. They were no longer able to uh, eat um, indigenous food. The Inuit uh, community that uh, the little book, Fatty Legs, the picture book, Fatty Legs, uh, was written about. And that's a book you might want to use with very young uh, children, kindergarten and up, uh, deals with this in a very simple way. And the little girl, when she goes back, she wants desperately to go to school. She wants to learn to read. And but when she comes back, she can't she can't eat the food that her parents are eating because she hasn't had it. And she's her taste buds have changed and she she's finding it very hard to reenter the community. That's an experience that we have to understand and appreciate about residential schools mm -hmm. and it can be taught. Um, it can be taught at younger ages without uh, adding in the more gruesome aspects of that history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one thing I really want to also just emphasize is that a lot of times people feel that the focus is always on the past. It's always on everything, you know, the stories that are very tragic. And yet we need to really be also looking at what's happening in Indigenous communities today or in the past that are where they're prospering, where there are wonderful things happening. And I know I'm going to um, be posting for everyone. There's the TDO Kids Raven's Quest, where it actually shows uh, young people who are doing, you know, amazing things in their lives. And it's perfect for grades one through three social studies. Um, but there's so many other ways that we can also celebrate, you know, Indigenous lives um, through the work through the stories that we tell as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was um, delighted to see um, Raven's Quest. Uh, as you do your research, and I think I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned earlier that it's really important for you as a teacher to uh, learn as much as you can about history. Uh, but one of the things that <clears throat> will come up is the blocks that have been put uh, in place for uh, Indigenous people who wish to participate in the ongoing um, business of um, the Canadian economy. And, um, and this started right away at uh, when people were put on reserves. There were all sorts of rules. My friend John tells me that his um, his grandmother was had to get a, a pass in order to be able to go out and sell a few uh, vegetable, extra vegetables that she had been able to grow. And sometimes that pass wasn't available and, you know, it was all controlled by the uh, Indian agent who was there. And, um, and so uh, the people who argue, you know, these people need to be, um, to need to be part of the current economy. Um, well, indeed, but if they were part of the current economy, maybe the current economy would look very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it might be time that we start listening to um, the ideas that Indigenous people have about ways to respect um, what they would refer to as uh, our mother, the, the earth, and to make sure that there are things available for the next generation going. So, um, so I uh, feel we have much to learn mm -hmm. from Indigenous people. I wanted to mention just briefly another book that um, that has come out recently. It's called Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. And um, this book was done uh, by a musician that people of my generation knew as a member of the band, uh, a man named Robbie Robertson, who is a Canadian from Six Nations. And uh, his uh, community, the um, Haudenosaunee community, uh, was were governed at the time of contact. Actually, uh, some people suggest maybe from uh, 1100 Common Era uh, by a um, a system of government called the Great Law of Peace. That information about the Great Law of Peace is available from a man named Rick Hill, um, who is a scholar at Six Nations, and um, the the Great Law of Peace. Um, <clears throat> is uh, was originally an oral 
law. It took three days to say it. Uh, the man who um, could say it in all of the uh, different uh, Haudenosaunee languages, because it was a treaty that held the Haudenosaunee um, tribes together. Um, and uh, he just died recently, a man named Jake Thomas. But, um, but Rick Hill is your source for that. And this book was written, for, and there's a song to go with it and uh, played by Robbie Robertson, um, what came out just recently. The, the law is one of the most fascinating structures for governance that I've ever run across. It uh, outdoes um, British democracy, American democracy. It, is, um, it has such fascinating elements to it. For instance, the children who are seen to be um, potential leaders are recognized for their ability to uh, be wise and, and, um, and help others, are trained by the elders, the women in the community, for um, since childhood to become the chiefs. The elders, the women, put into the circle of decision makers, the people who want to represent, they want to represent their community and can withdraw those chiefs uh, if they don't approve of what they're doing. Uh, the women have the vote. I mean, it is, it is an astounding uh, structure. I suggest you read it because uh, this was not a group of savages who were to be civilized. As far as my understanding is, they were a group of very wise people who were, whose cultures were, um, were decimated and then, um, and then destroyed but not completely, luckily for all of us. And uh, we have vivid, uh, very vibrant uh, indigenous communities with very wise and gentle leaders right now that I suggest you all get to know. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. I feel like I've learned um, so much more just by listening to you speak again today and just bringing back a lot of the memories of the work that we did. So. Well, just Tracy, so you were a, a leader for me too. I can't say how much I learned from you. So it was definitely a reciprocal relationship. Thank you very much for allowing me to do this. I think the work is so important and I'm so proud of you for well, taking this on. Thank you so much, Nancy. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for watching today. Um, and again, if you have any questions, um, I will make sure that I get them to Nancy if there's any thing that you want to ask her. Otherwise, I'll make sure as well to be posting the different links of all of the resources that Nancy has talked about today, um, the books and uh, Raven's Quest, all of those things. Other than that, um, if you want to know more about Embodied Learnings, if you haven't been to our website, it's www.embodiedlearnings.com. And until next week, I wish you all very well. Thank you so much. Have a great You're day. You're most welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.